Last week I preached on the virgin birth, and today I'm going to take a little bit of a different track, but I, I, I pray this is a Christmas message as well. I, my son, when he puts up the, the videos on, the, uh, on YouTube and on the website, um, he always asks me for a title to the message, and I, I'm pretty bad about coming up with titles to the messages, but if I had one today, I would call it the treasure of the Christmas gift. How many of y'all just loved Christmas gifts when you were growing up? You just couldn't wait to open your presents. Well, the greatest present has already been given. It just uh, hasn't been received by everyone yet, and we haven't been able to open it all up fully and completely yet, but it is a very important thing. Uh, Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, uh, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, God's gift. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I believe the magnificence of the good news of Jesus Christ is the story of salvation. We call it the gospel. It is what makes everything wonderful. It is God's gracious gift. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and we will call his name Emmanuel. That means God with us. What a blessing it is. But if you have your Bibles, look in 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Paul kind of gives us a great outline of what the gospel is. He says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. There's a lot of things I still fully don't comprehend about the good news of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things that I sense about it. I, I try to understand it, but, but we kind of look at it. Sometimes it's a little difficult to fully understand it. So Paul gives us an outline here. Number one, God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus had to come in humanity, born of that Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit, the little baby that came in Bethlehem that is what we think of so much about for Christmas. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels. Now, when God created them and, and all those angels in glory, those angels were there. They knew Jesus. They saw him in his glory. The angels would sing his praise. They saw him in the perfection of all that was there. And really, some of those angels even saw Jesus and, and saw all the glory that he got, and they wanted that too. They coveted that glory. And they thought that they were just as good as Jesus was. They wanted to be on the same level, and that was sin. That was pride for them because nobody's on the level of Jesus Christ. But he was seen by the angels, but it also says preached among the Gentiles, preached in the world. Now, there was God's chosen people, the Jews people, but aren't you grateful that we get an opportunity to hear about Jesus too? Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm saved because of that. Preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world. That's the miracle. Generation after generation, century, millennial, people hear believe, and are saved and become part of God's wonderful, glorious family. It's believed on in the world. Christianity works. I don't know if I can say it any better way than that. And then he says, and, uh, and received up in the glory. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I, I want to talk about that little word here that Paul uses. He says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godless, godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Manifest. Now, when you think of that word, the very first thing that comes to my mind is just made known. He was made known in the flesh. But really, this is what the world, word means. It was that which was in the pre-existing form that was delivered into the world, presented to us, made known to us. So we think about this. This is a story of God, Jesus being God, being in glory, 
but having a plan where we could come to know him. So the pre-existing God stepped into time and was made known unto us, came as the little baby in the manger, lived the sinless life. His story was preached in the world. Not all believed him then, and they crucified him because of jealousy. And he gave his life and was buried, but was resurrected three days later and was received in new life and received in it when he ascended back to glory. That's the story. It was God manifested for us. Peter also likes this phrase manifested. First Peter chapter 1 says this, He that is Jesus indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. He was chosen before the foundation of the world and was manifest in these last times for you. And aren't you grateful that God let him be presented to us? John says in 1 John 3, 8, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, that is, the works of sin. I also want to, I, I love 1 John, the Apostle John's letter. This is the 1 John 1, beginning verse 1. I'm going to read a lot of scripture, but stay, stick with me here. That which was from the beginning. There was no beginning to Jesus. He was there in the beginning. And the Apostle John, who was one of the disciples, right? He, will, he walked with Jesus. It says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled, concerning the, the logos, the word of life. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Here's what he says. He said, we got to hear him, we got to watch him, we got to see him, we looked upon him, we were there with him, and the life was manifested. We got to see what God had planned and presented that great Christmas gift. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. This is a miracle. The Christmas story is a miracle that we get to hear too, the good news of Jesus Christ. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy, this is His wish for you, your joy might be full. He wants you to have it all. He wants you to know the blessings of life. He wants you to know all those wonderful things. God loves you. Now look over in Hebrews 10. Uh, Hebrews is a wonderful book that was written so that the New Testament could be uh, explained and presented to the Jews as well. When you see the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see Jesus living his life. But the Jewish people then didn't all believe in him. They didn't all trust in him. And a matter of fact, they were kind of against him and crucified him. Not all the Jewish people, but a lot of it. When you get to the book of Acts, you see the resurrected Christ, and you get to see how he is there, and the gospel is presented to the world, and people believed everywhere. What The, the church was born. And then when you get to Paul's epistles, that great apostle Paul started taking the gospel everywhere so that others could know about him too. But the book of Hebrews takes the New Testament of Jesus Christ and presents it to those Jewish people who they had the Old Testament. And the Old Testament talked about Jesus Christ as the Christ, as the Messiah, but it also talked about all the sacrifices, the body sacrifices that had to be made, the, the blood of bulls and of goats and of lambs and all that. If, you, if y'all have ever read the book of Leviticus, it's a bloody book as it describes all of those offerings that would have to be given, all those sacrifices that would be given. 
when you look and you see those things, it, it, was, it was there so that they could understand the good news of God. Look in Hebrews 10, verse 1. I'm just going to kind of walk slowly through this. You know, I, I've learned that it's not my words that y'all need. It's God's word, right? So I'm going to just do my best just to illuminate the perfection of God's word given by his spirit to your heart. Look in verse 1. For the law, that is what they were taught, the ways to God, having a shadow of the good things to come. It wasn't the bright light yet. They couldn't really see it. In the Old Testament, it was just a shadow of what would come, what would be presented in Jesus Christ. And not the very image of the things can never, that, that Old Testament, that old way, can never with these same sacrifices which they offered continuously year by year, it could never make those who approach perfect. All of those offerings, all of those oxen and bulls and goats, the lambs, they couldn't cleanse people from their sins. They were just a, a symbol. Look in verse 2. For then they, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. If it, if it actually gave forgiveness, then they wouldn't have had to keep doing them over and over and over again. But he said, for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin, but they weren't forgiven. It was just a symbol. Verse number three. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he, that is Jesus, came into the world, he said this, and this is a quotation of Psalms chapter 40. Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. God wasn't satisfied by the blood of bulls and of goats. Look in verse 5. But a body you have prepared for me, for God. It wasn't the blood of a bull or a goat that was on a burnt offering. That's not what satisfied the sin. God took it himself. He said, you prepared a body for me so that the proper sacrifice could be given. Verse number six, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come, Jesus says, in the volume of the books it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Look in verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifices for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Our Lord ascended back to glory, resurrected, and it's now watching over you. He knows what's going through your minds, knows your thoughts, hears your prayers, knows your circumstances. He is watching over everything that you are doing right now. Verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. By that one offering on the cross of Calvary, he perfected forever. That word perfected, when we looked at it, we think something that's sinless, something that's pure, something that's, something that's undefiled. It, it's perfected. But though Jesus was perfect, that's not what that word means. That word means perfected there. It, and I know us preachers, we like to always talk about what that word means and what that word was. Well, this is really important. The word is uh, teleau, and, and it means, let, let me just read the definition to you. It means a purpose for which a thing was made as being fulfilled. The purpose for which something was made as being fulfilled. Let me see if I can explain this. An acorn has everything in it that it needs, but it's not there yet. Though it is everything of a tree, 
it hasn't grown into that yet. So we would say the tree is perfected what the acorn had in its intent. Y'all got that? The tree is the fulfilled purpose. A little child is born. I mean, you go up to the hospital and there's balloons everywhere and everybody's celebrating because a life is there. And, and, and the parent takes it, tries to feed it, right? You clothe it a little bit and you sing to it and you pray over it and you love on it and you hug it so close. And when, you, when you're holding that baby, you think of all those dreams that you have for that child, all those hopes, all the things that you hope would be fulfilled. But it's not there yet. Though it has everything then, the man or the woman is the perfected of what began in the baby. God in eternity had a foreordained plan of love for us. He wanted you to have everything. He wanted you to, to not have turmoil in your life, but to have peace. Not to have strife, but to have joy. He wanted everything that was of himself, his nature, all that he had. He wanted it to be given to you, but to get us from where we are as sinners to where he is, the holder of all that is good and perfect in love, Jesus came born of the virgin. Not of man, but conceived of the Holy Spirit. And everything that was of God became man in that Virgin Mary, born in Bethlehem. And to, to fulfill the plan, the purpose, to perfect that plan to live the sinless life, to be obedient in all things, to tell the good news, to show the example of what the life would be, to be rejected, to be crucified, to be buried, but to be resurrected and ascended to glory. And by the way, and loving on you right now, caring about you right now, what happened then was God's perfection for us. The salvation that we think of, that's exactly what he's trying to say there. But look look what it says there. Go back to, um, if you would, Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to stay in Hebrews 2 for a while longer. Look what it says in verse 9. You there? Say amen. If you're not there, say wait. I'm going to get you one way or another. Look in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Hold on. The angels were giving a celestial body. They don't die. They don't die. They live forever. We have to live. We're gonna, our soul is going to live forever, but we go through this body of death. So understand this, he was made lower than the angels when he came and became human. Think about this. All those angels that were created that saw his glory, those that were jealous of it and, and thought, I, I'm as good as he is, and they were perfected until they sinned. But Jesus, when he came, did not come as the prince to be born into some palace somewhere. He came lower than the angels, took on a human body, one that would have to die. I wonder what those angels thought when they said, really? He's going to do this? I wonder why he's doing this. Look what it says. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crown with glory and honor. 
that he, that is Jesus, by the grace of God, might taste death for, what's that word? Does that include anybody, everybody? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, he created all things, and by whom are all things, he sustains all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation, come on now, perfect through sufferings. Teliau. To get the fulfilled destiny, he would have to go through sufferings. To find the finished perfect plan, he had to go through what the symbol in the Old Testament, the, the bull or the lamb. When Abel came to worship God, Adam and Eve's son, he came bringing a blood offering, looking forward to what Jesus would do. Perfected through sufferings. Perfected through sufferings. Luke 12, 50 says this. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and now I am distressed. Literally, I am in agony until it is accomplished. John 12 says this, Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this reason I came to this hour. Luke twenty two forty two 42 said, Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, Thy will be done. Luke twenty two forty four 44 says this, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. He was under that much strain, that much suffering. Yet it pleased the Lord, Isaiah 53 says. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see the labor, literally the travail of his soul, and be satisfied. When I think of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, out of love, he allowed them to do all the things that they did to him. The king of kings who had a crown of diadems let them put a crown of thorns on his head. The one who gives us life, they beat him. I think of the spittle on his face when they took and slapped his face and pulled out his beard when they whipped him with a cat of nine tails, when they cursed him and mocked him, when he quietly allowed them to lay him on that cross and pierce his hands and his feet, raised between heaven and earth, all out of love, Hebrews 4 said he went through all these things so that he could be a high priest who could know what we go through. He knows how you feel. He knows your sufferings. <laughs> this morning, it was about 30 degrees. I got up and got dressed early before I walked out of the house to get in my nice warm truck. I put on my top coat, 
Y'all know what I'm talking about? Those big overcoats that you put on? I got to church and I got out of my truck. I had my hot coffee in my hand. And I got out and I felt the cold and it went through my mind. My Lord knew what cold was. He knew what hunger was. I walked across that pavement and I thought, he knew what it was like to sleep on the hard ground. Have dew in the morning on his face. Who knew what it was like to shake? He knew what it was like to be misunderstood. He knew what it was like to be ridiculed. He knew what it was like to be rejected. Misunderstood and have a friend turn his back on him. One time he said to the throngs of people that were there, when many of them started to turn and walk away, he looked at his disciples and said, are you going to leave me too? He knew what it was like to have a plan that was more important even than family. He left glory and came down here to this world where there would be death and despair and disease and dread. And the Bible says that the path to our salvation was through His sufferings so that He could be that faithful high priest. When you say, nobody knows how I feel, He does. I can look at you and I may not have ever been through that place that you've gone through. I used to have to be with people that had lost loved ones, and I was their pastor, and I'm sitting there trying to, to love on them and minister to them, but many times I had no idea what it was like. But with time, we all understand the path of life. I've had to be on the, though I've never experienced it, I've had to be there with they lost their children. I don't know what that's like don't want to know what that's like. But my heavenly Father knows what it's like when His only begotten Son became sin. God had to turn His back on Him. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I've had to be there with others when they lost parents, but I've been there myself. I know what that brokenness is like. My Lord knows what you're going through. My Lord knows your pain. He knows your anguish. He knows your hurts. He allowed himself. Allowed himself. So, he, so that he could be that faithful high priest. He cared. He was willing to give up everything so that you could know everything. You could know the good of it. I got thinking about this, and I started thinking about the purpose of the Lord's suffering. I wrote three things down I'm going to share with you real quickly. Number one, so he could identify with us and be made one with us. Look what it says in Hebrews 2, verse 11. Both he who sanctifies, that's Jesus, and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to be called them, to call them brethren. He's my brother. He allowed himself to go through those things. Look what it says in verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise share in the same that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil. 
Look in verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels. No, there's no salvation for the angels that are fallen. But he says, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. That's us. Therefore, in all things, did you catch that? In all things, he had to be made like his brethren so that he could identify with us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in, in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. To make the way. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Praise God. We have a king priest who knows what we're like. Who knows what we go through. All of our heartaches and our shame. But number two, not only was he identified with us, he came to deliver us from death. Look what it says back in the ninth verse again. It said, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Look what it says in verse 15. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. How many of y'all going to die? Raise your hand. I see some of y'all got some hope. <laughs> I'll probably be there at your funeral. If God tarries, guess what? Statistics are against us. If God tarries... One out of one of us are going to die. That means every one of us. Every one of us are going to know what it means to taste the sting of death. We'll close our eyes to this world. and We'll have to face what that death is. But guys, I got a word for you. Death is only the gate to heaven. You can't get there without it. Unless... I mean, if the trumpet blows and Jesus comes back to gather his own, we're out of, I'm out of here, and I hope you are too. Amen? But if he tarries his coming, we got to go through the avenue of death. Matter of fact, next Sunday, Lord willing, I'm going to preach on the second coming of Christ. I figure if I talk about the virgin birth and I talk about the life that he lived, I might as well talk about the home going. Amen? And that's the third thing. He came to identify with us. He came here to defeat death, which after they crucified him and put him into that tomb, Resurrection Sunday, he arose up from the grave, he arose. Amen? And is now ascended back to glory. But number three, that's the last thing. He wants to take you to heaven. None of us know what it's like for the love of God to leave heaven, to come here, to be like us. Why? Why would he want to do such a thing? The word perfected there means there is a beginning, but there's also the fulfillment that would come. May 24th, 1962, Brian, in this earth, had a beginning. but there will be no end. I might have to walk through that, that gate of death, but the Bible that I read says absent from the body is what? Say it again. Present with the Lord. So he ascended back to glory. I'll just have to go the other door. Amen. I'll just go through that door of death and I'll just be with him. So that everything that is in the divine nature of God he wanted us to have an opportunity to have it. He wanted us to know joy, complete joy. He wanted us to know love, total and complete love. He wanted us to know, I hope this word fits with you, satisfaction. I'm never going to have that down here. 
Because no matter how, you ever, you ever had one of those days you just wanted to, to, to grab that moment, take a picture of that moment? You never wanted to lose that moment. You just thought it was so wonderful. It was so good. I, I just never want to let go of it. But down here, we always have to, right? But not there. Joy, unspeakable and full of glory. He has loved us with an everlasting love, one that never diminishes, one that never goes away. What an amazing, mighty, glorious God to take us home. I love verse 10. Let me read this verse one more time. Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, and I pray more and more, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And his perfect gifts, gift to you is that same perfection. The fulfillment is me and you with him in heaven. He was willing. We love with a temporary love. We love because it brings us enjoyment. It satisfies us. And if it doesn't satisfy us, we'll quit loving it. That's human love. But God's love is not looking for anything back but just to honor and bless. And His joy is seeing our face. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now sitting down at the right hand of God in heaven. Doing what he needs to be doing, watching over us, taking care of us, loving on us, providing for us, protecting us, keeping us, perfecting us all the way home. How many of y'all looking forward to death? Amen. Don't leave me here. Don't leave me here. I'm looking forward to it. People are like, they're afraid of the avenue of death. You know, we don't get to choose that. That's a good thing. I think one of the, 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 the most terrifying things in scripture was Hezekiah got sick. Isaiah said, you're going to die. God says, you're going to die. He prayed and God said, okay, you got 15 more years. By the way, he messed up terribly in that last 15 years. But how, how would you like to have lived in knowing, well, I got 14 more to go, 10 more, five more. This is the year. Lord, this is the day. I don't think I'd like that. I kind of like the being surprised part. Amen. And none of us are going to know all that's on the other side of that gate to heaven. But to see him face to face, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. The old people used to say, I got a shingle up in glory, right? Or I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Mark, you remember that song? I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. And that sweet land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we'll never more wander. But what? Walk those streets of purest gold. I just get to enjoy the glory of ever. The greatest gift of Christmas is salvation in Jesus Christ. You don't want to leave this world without it. You want to know all the glories of the perfection that God has planned for you. You do not want to spend your eternity without the presence of God's love, joy, peace, hope, satisfaction. Somehow, in the South, we think everybody's going to heaven. I'm a good person. I'm going to heaven. There is none good, no, not one. 
what the Bible says. Well, I've been to church my whole life. Well, I appreciate that. And it doesn't matter how many times you've gone to church. It doesn't how much you've given to this cause or that cause or the other cause. The only thing that's going to give you, get you into heaven is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. That means that you come to a place where you say to him, I believe that you were God's son. I believe that you lived a sinless life. I know that you went through those things for me. You suffered for me, even to the place of the cross where they, you gave your life for me. They buried you. They put you in the tomb. But on Resurrection Sunday, you came forward. You are alive and well. You ascended back to glory. You are watching over me. You are taking care of me. And to you, O oh Lord, I give my life to you. I repent of my sins that separated. Come into my heart and save me. I am yours. You are mine. You see, it really doesn't matter how many times you've heard someone say that. What matters is that you personally experience that. That's the greatest gift. That's the perfect Christmas gift. Salvation in Jesus Christ.